Matthew chapter 10, look at verse number 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, Till the Son of Man become. Jesus had just sent His disciples out. He had called them, and last week we preached about this, and He called them all, called them by name, and He sent them out to go preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And He told them they're going to go out, and He told them what to take and what not to take. And then He gives them a little bit more instruction, and that's where verse 16 picks up. And He says, here's how I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Just in case you thought this was just going to be a big party, just in case you thought it was just going to be a whole lot of fun. Now, it is fun serving the Lord, and there's no greater joy than serving the Lord, but there is persecution. There are challenges. There are the times when you have to stand up, and you're the only one standing up. And Jesus says, I'm sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm just going to break this down. We're going to, we're going to go through these verses, but probably spend more time on the first two or three of them than on the last half of this, um, this little passage here of Jesus sending out these disciples. First thing I want you to get is this. We are sent. We are sent. If you're saved this morning, you have been sent. God has a plan for you. But here's what I want you to really get is this. Jesus is the one who sent us. He's talking to the disciples in this case, and it's not just that they're being sent, but it's that Jesus is the one sending them. What an honor to be sent by Jesus. Can you imagine being one of those disciples that we referred to this last week, and and Jesus calling you, but then Jesus saying, listen, I'm sending you to do my work. What an honor. The Son of God, the Creator of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords has sent us. And as you go out, And yes, we're going out as sheep in the midst of wolves. You can remember this. I am sent. And I am sent by Jesus. I'm sent by my Savior. I'm sent by the Creator. We represent Jesus Christ to the world. God could have chosen a different method to reach the world, but He chose us. What an honor this is. What a great responsibility at the same time. We get to be soul winners. We get to teach the Bible. We get to stand for God in a sinful world. We, we get to. What an honor it is. It's not like we have to go into this world and say, oh man, I have to do this. I have to be a Christian. I have to be separated from the world. I have to tell people about Jesus. No, that's not it at all. I get to serve God. I get to serve the Lord. He is the one who called and he said, I send you. Behold, I send you forth. Now we are like sheep. We're like sheep surrounded by wolves. Now, just because I don't have a lot of experience with sheep and wolves, really neither, I I have a little bit of experience with sheep. We had one of the people in our neighborhood that raised sheep, and every time you'd drive by their house, you would smell the sheep. So I know a little bit about sheep. I know sheep stink. I know they're cute and cuddly and all that, but they stink. And um, you can make great stuff out of their their clothes. You can make clothes out of their clothes, right? You can make wool. And I know a little bit about sheep. I know a little bit about wolves. I know that uh, there was a big bad wolf, I know that there's the, the three little pigs. We have a story at our house. It's called The Three Little Wolves and the Big, big Bag, Big Bad Pig. It's a great read, and maybe one of these days we'll use it for an illustration. I know, I know a little bit about wolves. I, I know, uh, I talked to one of my friends. He's, he was, uh, worked at a camp down at Apache Creek. Uh, Pastor Matthew Wooten, he's, he's the one that told me this. And he said this. He said, listen, whenever our kids, whenever the kids from this area, Catrone County, go to school, they have to wait for the school bus. And whenever they have to wait for the school bus, they have to wait in a cage because the wolves are being reintroduced to our area, the Mexican wolves. And so our kids have to wait in a cage to keep them safe. 
So I know a little bit about wolves. He told me a little bit about that. You see all the wool, the, the bumper stickers, let wolves live, bring back the wolves or whatever it is. And, and sure, but not at the expense of our kids. So I know a little bit, a little bit about wolves. Um, I had a dream about a wolf. It was, it was actually, a, a, I think it was the big bad wolf. I was probably about five, five years old. Um, it was one of those recurring dreams. You ever have one of those that just keeps coming back? I had one about jumping off of, of a basketball goal. I had it for I don't know how many years. I kept having the same dream over. But this one, I remember, it was the big bad wolf, and he came, and he was trying to blow our school down. And it was one of those times I went into my parents' room, and, and you know, just kind of, I was, I was so scared. I don't know a whole lot about them. So I watched some YouTube videos about wolves and how, how wolves attack sheep. And you know, this, these were, I mean, this is enlightening type of stuff right here. I almost showed you one, but... Uh, I just, uh, it, we didn't have time this morning to get all that in. Let me tell you a little bit about wolves and, and a little bit about sheep. We are like sheep, surrounded by wolves. You know, wolves usually work together. It's one of the things I learned as I was watching some of the discovery type of, of video, National Geographic videos, right? Wolves work together. If a wolf is by itself, a, long, a lot of times it, it loses its prey, but then when they work together, uh, the, the prey is in trouble. A wolves look for the weak member of the herd. Wolves try to separate the weak member from the herd. I saw one video of a, a wolf pack chasing a, a herd of buffalo. You ever heard of buffalo? Okay, there's a herd of buffalo. I told you I was with teens all week, okay? Just bear with me. Wolves chasing this herd of buffalo. Buffalo are huge. A wolf can't take down a buffalo, but if you get enough of them, then they start chasing the buffalo. The buffalo get confused. They start running. And eventually, the little baby buffalo gets separated from the rest of the herd. And, and the wolves, because they work in packs and because they try to separate the prey from the herd, they got their meal. They try to separate the weak member from the shepherd. You know, we're like sheep. Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. We've been sent into the world as sheep. Into the midst of wolves. I'm going to give you a bunch of quick lessons, and I'm going to come back to, this, back to this text. First of all, we can't do God's work in our own power. We're sheep in the midst of wolves. It can't be. It, we cannot force ourselves. We're sheep. We're weak. We're really powerless. I mean, if we got a world of wolves out there and we're the sheep, we can't do this work on our own. It's got to be God that works through us. We must completely rely upon God. We're sheep in the midst of wolves. We can't defend ourselves. The battle, and I'm not talking about physically, if somebody attacks you, defend yourself. But we are sheep in the midst of wolves. We've got to trust God that, that he can defend us. And, and you've got to understand this, the battle is bigger than any of us. If you've read Ephesians chapter 6, you understand that. Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. Why are we supposed to put on the armor of God? Well, because in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the very next verse, the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are sheep in the midst of wolves. We can't defend ourselves. If we try to live this life in our own power, we try to protect ourselves from this world in our own strength, we're going to lose. We can't defend ourselves. We would be like one sheep. Sheep and sheep are plural and singular the same, right? Am I saying that right? One sheep is one sheep. Two sheep are two sheep. Right? Okay, so I want to make sure I'm doing this right. So I am one sheep. I cannot defend myself in a, in a world of wolves by myself. I, I, I need God to help me to do that. What a great picture, sheep. In the midst of wolves, we can't intimidate the enemy on our own. Imagine a sheep backing down a, one sheep. You got a sheep on this side, you got a wolf on this side. And, and the, the wolf's about to attack the sheep, and you see the sheep scaring off a wolf. That's, that's not going to happen. We can't intimidate the enemy on our own. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. The problem is, so many times, we try to take the enemy on on our own. We think, I can do this by myself, and we neglect our, our Bible time, and we ne neglect our prayer time. And when we do that, we're going into this world as sheep among wolves, and we're taking them on on our own, and we're thinking, I can do this. We think that. We think, uh, yeah, I can, I can handle this. I've handled this to this point before. But you've got to remember, we are sheep in the midst of wolves. Don't let the enemy separate you from the protection of the herd. 
these are just a lot of little side lessons here before we get back to the text, but just as we consider that we are sheep and we're in the midst of a, a world of wolves, don't let the wolves separate you from the protection of the herd. The herd. Wolves win when they outnumber their prey. I saw a, a wolf attacking a moose. Moose are huge. Now, this one, moose and meese. No, I'm kidding. Moose and moose. So, moose are, moose are huge. I, I, I didn't know this. I thought a moose would attack like a horse would attack. Anybody ever been kicked by a horse? Horses, that is horse and horses. Right? Horses, they don't, they don't kick frontwards. They kick backwards. You ever, you ever notice that? If, you, if somebody gets kicked by a horse, the horse sometimes will jump, turn around, and you know, karate kick them with, with their back feet. And then moose are different. I did not know this until this week. Moose have very sharp hooves, and they kick frontwards like that. I saw a video of a wolf attacking a moose. It was kicking. And now the wolf defended itself, but because there was a pack of wolves, the wolf lost its baby. I'm sorry, the moose lost its baby moose. Now the moose, the moose can attack and the moose can kick, um, but, but it's still, these, whenever the enemy separates you from the protection of the herd, you will lose. God gave us this wonderful thing that's called a church for, to, to assemble and, and to, to be encouraged and to grow and to be challenged and to reach the world. And, 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 and we are part of this church. And let me just challenge you as, as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Don't let the wolf packs separate you from the church. Whatever it is, maybe it's hard times. Maybe, maybe it's somebody, and this happens so many times, it's somebody gets their feelings hurt. We, we all get our feelings hurt sometimes. You're going to get your feelings hurt. I'm probably going to hurt your feelings at some point. Somebody else sitting here might hurt your feelings. Don't let that separate you from, from, from the church. Don't let that separate you from, we call, it a, we call it a herd. Jesus doesn't call us a herd. It's not a herd of sheep. I know it's a flock of sheep, but I'm going to keep going back to that, all right, because that's what I wrote down. Um, and I was thinking it was a herd earlier. Don't, don't let, don't let uh, the world separate you. Don't let another Christian separate you from the protection that is in the herd. Stay away from places where you're easy to catch. I almost showed a video this morning. I'll show it probably for a youth conference or something like that, but I'll tell you what it was. There's a, it was in India. There's a fence with a bunch of little sheep in it. I don't know what kind of sheep they were. They looked kind of like goats, but they, they'd call them all sheep. So they were, they, were, they were in this fence, and the fence was probably about, I don't know, about six, six seven feet tall, something like that. It was a wire fence, and there was a, a wolf. That, that kept coming up and sneaking up to the fence. And, and the, the, the little baby sheep, goats, whatever they were, they'd, they'd stick their head out to look at the wolf. And the wolf would get close, and they'd pull their head back in, and meh, 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 you know, make, making sheep noises. And they'd pull their head back in, and the wolf would try, and, but he couldn't get them. The wolf kept coming back. The, the wolf started, and on, on the top of this, there was a, they, they put some like burlap, some, some cloth on there, so the wind, the wind would blow. It would scare the wolf. It would, it would blow, and the wolf would get startled, and, but then he would come back. The wolf started taking apart the, the, the burlap, and he, started, he came up and started dragging sticks away. And Eventually, these, these sheep that really seemed to want to know what was going on outside of this pen, they, one of them found a way out. And it found a way out, and it was running, and it was running, and it, I don't know if it realized it was in danger ever, but as soon as the wolf saw him, this little sheep out all by itself, away from the protection of this fence, he, the wolf attacked, grabbed him by the neck, and he saw the wolf run off. And I was thinking, why in the world would somebody video that? That was my first thought. But, but you see that happen. The Bible says flee fornication. The Bible says flee from idolatry. The Apostle Paul writing in Timothy, he says, flee these things, the love of money, temptations of riches, hurtful lusts, other things. Uh, he says, flee also youthful lusts. We're sheep in the midst of wolves. Stay away from places where you're easy to catch. There are some places where a wolf can't catch a sheep very well. You get some of the, the mountain sheep, and a wolf just, just can't catch the mountain sheep. You get into the, to the deep snow or, or something like that. Then there's places in, in the middle of the, the pack or the herd or the flock. Um, if, if, uh, if it's a, if a flock won't work, okay, bad illustration, because a wolf will get into a, a flock and, and can destroy the whole flock, which is another message about protecting our church, which will be another time. <clears throat> Stay away from the places, <clears throat> excuse me, where a wolf will attack. There's some places as a Christian we just should not go. 
because wolves going to attack. There's some places where, 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 where sin abounds, if you can say it that way. Let me just challenge you. Stay away from places where you're easy to catch. Wolves are known to chase their prey for up to 12 miles. They don't give up. They have amazing stamina. Speaking of the Antichrist, during the tribulation, the prophet Daniel wrote this down. He's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. He's talking about the Antichrist, and he's talking how the Antichrist is going to relate to the Christians. And here's what he said. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. It's going to wear us out. Like the wolf that keeps tracking and keeps tracking and keeps chasing and keeps chasing until the prey gets worn out. They have an amazing stamina. We can't trust ourselves. We can't, we can't defend ourselves. So what do we do? We trust our shepherd. We've got to trust our shepherd. 1 John 4, 4, the Bible says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. But then later on we see this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's okay if I'm sent out as a sheep in the midst of a wolf. Um, in another place, I think it was in Luke, it's either Mark or Luke, Jesus is teaching the same thing, and he says, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. We would think a, a baby lamb even, even less um, defenses than, than a sheep, but we don't have to worry about that because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Get okay, back to our text. We are sent as sheep in the midst of wolves. Then he says this, Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We've got four animals so far. We've got sheep, we've got wolves, you've got serpents, and you've got doves. I don't like wolves and I don't like snakes. I really don't even like doves because they wake you up early in the morning cooing. I guess if you go dove hunting, you might like doves. I don't even like sheep, come to think of it. But here we got four animals and we're going to talk about that. He says, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We, we know this, but we need wisdom. If we're going to be sheep in the midst of wolves, we need wisdom. I said not to go to places where you're easy to catch. We need wisdom to stay away from those places. We need wisdom to, to stay together and, and uh, stay in the protection of, of the herd or stay under the protection of the shepherd. We need wisdom. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. There's all kinds of definitions for wisdom, but I like this one the best. Seeing life from God's perspective. In Fort Worth, there's a place called the Stockyards. Has anybody ever been to the Fort Worth Stockyards? In the Stockyards is this place, it's, it's, a, it's a human maze. The walls are so tall that you can't see over them. Uh, we went into the maze before. I, I took some, some kids on a class field trip. And I took my kids there before. And, and you can go into the maze. You have to pay to get into the maze. And you've got to go try to find some, uh, all the different places, different numbers, and, and then you've got to get out of the maze. Once you get in, you, you can't find your way around. Now, looking at a maze from the top is totally different. You can, you, some of you that know how to do mazes, you, you can follow it from the back to the front, or you can kind of follow it through. If it doesn't work, you can go a different direction. It's totally different doing it on paper than doing it live, walking through a maze. I've gotten into that maze, and I've gotten lost. You can get into the maze, and you, you find dead ends, and you think you're almost to the, to the exit, and you find out you're at another dead end. But in the middle of this maze, in the stockyards of Fort Worth, Texas, there's an observation deck. So the people who don't want to pay can just go for free and watch the other people make a fool of themselves who did pay. So you can walk up on top, and you can look down, and you can see the maze. And you can see where your kids are. And so my kids are walking around through there, and, and I can say, hey, don't turn left, turn right, because left is a dead end. And I can kind of guide them through it if they get lost, and I can help them to get to the next number, and I, then I can help them find their way out, because I am above the maze. I'm on the observation deck. I was smart enough not to pay, and I came up, and I'm just watching other people walk around lost. And I can look down, and I can see the whole thing spread out. God's perspective. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. It's like you can, you can go up to where God is and, and look down and see your life. Now, our life is not a maze, but a maze is a good example of our life. We don't know which way to go. We don't know if I go this way. We don't know if the right turn in life, if this choice in life, we don't know where it's going to lead us, but God does. 
I don't know what decision. We all have decisions. We have decisions multiple times a day, every day, big decisions. I don't know where that decision is going to lead me, but God does. And wisdom is if I could step back and I could see my life like God sees my life. And Jesus said, listen, I'm sending you out like, like sheep in the midst of wolves, and you need wisdom. You need to see life like I see life. I know what's going to happen in the end. I know right now Jesus could have told every one of those disciples what the rest of their life was going to be like and how they would die. We've got a little picture of that when he's talking to Peter. He says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, and, and he says, feed my sheep. That happens three times, and, and then Jesus tells Peter how Peter is going to die. That, that's, that's what the text says. He could have done that for every one of the disciples. He could have told them what every decision they made would have led to, because God knows. That is, that is wisdom. It's, somebody said it, this, said it this way. Wisdom is seeing life through God's glasses. Kind of, the, kind of the same idea. If you could get God's view on life, you'd be able to make better decisions. Think about it. God knows everything about you. And he knows everything about everyone else. God knows what you're thinking. And he knows what everyone around you is thinking. Aren't you glad you don't know what everyone around you is thinking and everybody around you knows what you're thinking, right? But God does. He knows every thought that you have. That means he knows if the guy trying to sell you the car is telling you the truth about how well it runs. Okay, so we just turned a corner right from spiritual to practical. But did you know spiritual and practical really are intertwined? God knows. So I need wisdom whenever I go to buy the car. Very simple thing, very real life thing. I need God's wisdom because God knows if he's telling me the truth. I want to trust God. So that's a very practical thing, just a very normal thing. And a lot of times you think, well, the pastor knows how to buy a car. I don't know really how to buy a car, but I do know that God knows if that guy's telling you the truth. We need wisdom. God knows what he's thinking. God knows what you're thinking. God knows whether the guy or girl you want to date is telling you the truth about their past or not, God knows their heart. God knew that the one girl that flirted with me and got me to ask her out during Bible college, God knew that she had just been put up to asking me out on a dare. And she really, not asking me out, me asking her out, getting me to ask her out, however that worked out. Her and another girl were sitting up in the balcony at church, and they were just kind of bored, and they, one of them dared the other one, said, I dare you to get somebody to ask you out. So they looked around, and they picked. And I was one of them that got picked, because I'd happened to be in the wrong place at the right time. And she laid it on thick, and she came up, and she started flirting with me, and, you know, in a Christian Baptist kind of a way, okay? Um, she dropped her keys, and I picked them up for her. You know, that, you know that, that kind of thing. It wasn't like worldly flirting or anything. But she got me to ask her out. And I took it big, and I, I, I just thought, oh, I finally found the one who, she accepts me just like, I didn't know any of, God did. God did. It wasn't Jennifer, Brother Reed, all right? It was somebody else. Um, <clears throat> there's a page in the middle of the yearbook that opens up to the middle, and it's me and this other girl sitting on a date, like two pages. I didn't realize she knew a friend in the yearbook class that year and got it put in there. God knew that. God, God knows all that. God knows if, if the person you're, you're wanting to start a relationship is telling you the truth, if they love him or not. God knows who'd make a good business partner and who's going to cheat you. God knows the most effective way to raise your kids. It's wisdom. God knows who's going to take advantage of you and who you can trust. We need God's wisdom. We need to be able to see life from God's perspective. Can you imagine how it would change if we, we could ask God, God, I need your wisdom. I beg you for your wisdom. I forget where it's at. I didn't even think of it till just now. The New Testament, probably in James, where God gives wisdom to everyone who asks him. Would you ask him? God wants to give you wisdom. And Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. You need wisdom. But not only do we need wisdom, we need to be harmless. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus didn't send them out to attack people. He didn't send them out to, to bring his kingdom down by overthrowing all the other kingdoms. He said, no, I'm going to send you out and say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be wise as serpents, be harmless as doves. That's different for somebody trying to start a revolution. And this is what the disciples thought was happening. 
We're going to go out and we're going to start this revolution and we're going to bring Jesus as the king and he's going to be the king of the Jews. And that's not what Jesus was doing. Why is a serpent harmless as doves? Sheep don't have weapons. I mean, there's nothing about a sheep that really, I mean, if they kicked you, I've never been kicked. Anybody ever been kicked by a sheep? Okay, I'm sure they could kick, but their legs are kind of scrawny. It's not like a horse kicking you. Their teeth really are not that vicious. They don't have horns. They don't have a stinger in their tail. I mean, sheep are harmless. Sheep are these little balls of, of fluff. They're, 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 they've been used as far as people can go back in history making clothes and dinner. And these, are, these are harmless animals. They, they have no weapons. Some animals have weapons. I mean, you got snakes and spiders with poisonous fangs. You got lions and wolves, and tigers and bears. They have sharp teeth and claws. Crabs have pinchers. We, I found a little crab about this big. We were in Florida a couple years ago on vacation, and this is a little crab. We caught it in a cup. One of the kids caught it. It's probably one of the bigger crabs that we caught. You know, you walk along the beach, and they, they run and hide in their hole. They run sideways, and you kind of laugh at them. And we, we caught a couple, and I was holding it in my hand, and it's cool, and and we're like, hey, look at that cool little pincher that that crab has. It's about this big, a tiny little pincher. And one of the kids said, careful little pincher. I'm like, how much could that hurt? And I put my finger right up to the little, to the little pincher on the crab. The crab's like this big, okay? And I, and I said this, how much could it hurt? And that thing pinched, I think it was my thumb, that thing pinched me so hard, instantly blood came out, and I was trying to fling it off. Even crabs can defend themselves. Sheep don't have pinchers even. Bees and ants have stingers. Moose and horses use their feet as weapons. Porcupines have quills, but sheep have no weapons. And Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep. I'm sending you out as sheep, weaponless in the midst of wolves. What high school would choose sheep for a mascot? All right. Albuquerque, bulldogs, right? You got the eagles, the bears, the lions, the tigers, the sheep. Yeah, go sheep. <laughs> That'd be you know, their mascot, their call. Can you just say, no, nobody chooses sheep for their mascot. Okay, NFL teams, you've got the Chicago Bulls. Well, what if they had chosen the Chicago sheep? Yeah. Michael Jordan played for the Chicago sheep. Yeah. No. No. You pick a vicious animal, the, the Philadelphia sheep. <laughs> Okay, Eagles sounds better. I don't know if the team's any better, but Philadelphia, sheep. The, the Detroit, sheep. Every Thanksgiving, the Detroit sheep are playing. No, nobody would cheer for them. I don't know if anybody ever does. Um, Jesus wants us to serve him, you got to get this, without fighting. He didn't say, I want you to go take over the world for me. We can't use physical force to get people to convert. We can teach people that they're sinners. We can teach people there's a punishment for sin called hell or they'll be separated from God for all eternity. We can teach people that God loves them so much he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for their sins. We can teach people that if they trust Jesus and ask him to save them that they can have eternal life if they accept God's free gift of forgiveness. We can teach people how to be saved, but we can't force someone to get saved. We're sheep. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And he's really good at convicting hearts. I can't convict somebody to be saved. I can teach them. I mean, you're a sinner. The Bible says that we're all sinners. The punishment for sin is to die and go to hell. But God loves you so much. He died on the cross. He paid the price for your sins. If you will accept his gift of forgiveness, he will save you and forgive you. You will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Our memory verse for next week. But I can't force them. I can't force somebody to convert, to be saved. During the dark ages, the Catholic Church tried to convert the world by force. Their method, convert or die. Millions of people died at the hands of the Catholic Church during the Spanish Inquisition because they, they refused to convert. I, I, was, I don't have time to read this this morning. We're almost out of time. I've got a book full of Stories of people who died at the hands of the Catholic Church. This was April 1555. George Marsh, he was burnt at the stake. That means he was tied to a stick and burned to death. 
because he was a Christian and wouldn't get uh, baptized by the Catholic Church, basically is, is what it came down to. He believed that a person had to be saved and rebaptized because the Catholic Church baptism didn't count for salvation. Millions of people died. George Marsh was taken to the stake. He was tied to the stake, and, and he, was, he, was, he was left there to burn. The, 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 the sticks that they put underneath him, they really didn't catch fire good enough to kill him, so he burnt and burnt and burnt and burnt until all of his body was blistered over. They thought he was dead until right before he did die, and I do want to read this to you. He lifted up his hands and he said, Father of heaven, have mercy upon me. And he yielded his spirit into the hands of the Lord. The Fox's Book of Martyrs is a thick book. Page after page after page after page. Of people who died because there was a religious system that went out into the world and forced people to convert. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The weapons that we have been given are spiritual. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, we won't turn there right now, but you see that nearly everything is completely defensive. The helmet, the shoes, the breastplate, the loins girded about with truth. Everything is it's defensive except for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and praying always. The Word of God and prayer. You can't, well, I guess you could kill somebody with the Bible if you did it right, I guess. Um, that's not the intention. We're not supposed to go out and, and attack people. We're not supposed to go out and try to convert the world through, through force. Tell people. Teach people. Show people the gospel and let God save them. In chapter 10, verse 17, he says, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They'll scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. He says, Beware of men. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Let me explain it, he says. Beware of men. You'll be judged. He said this, they'll deliver you up to their counsels. You'll be judged by your peers. You picture a, a council of people picked from your neighborhood, and they're the ones that um, choose whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. And that, that, that's what he's talking about. We don't have to worry about that generally in our city. If there's a council from our neighborhood that has been chosen, they're probably going to tell you to take your trash cans in or to move your car that's leaking oil. What Jesus is saying is, listen, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, and there will be a day when the council will come together. A group of peers from, from your neighborhood, from your city, they will come together, and they will judge you, be judged by your peers. Maybe not in a courthouse, but in everyday life. They'll judge you for trying to be too spiritual. They'll judge you for trying to live a life of separation from the world. They may see things like, oh, you, just, you just think you're, you're better than us. They'll judge you for protecting your children from the world. I remember my parents being criticized by our family members for putting us in a Christian school. They fought that battle, early 70s, or late 70s actually. My parents stood up and they took the rejection, they took humiliation from their family to go and put their kids in a Christian school because they didn't want us being taught evolution and humanism and, and all of that. I'm so glad they just went ahead and took the judgment from their peers, the counsels of men. Your peers will judge you for being too fanatical. Let me give you a definition of a fanatic. A fanatic is anyone who loves Jesus more than you do. Anyone who loves Jesus more than you do. Now, that, that, that'll apply to other people as well. Let me give you an example. Anyone who loves Jesus more than they do is a fanatic. If you go to church on Sunday morning and they don't, you're a fanatic. If you give to God through your local church and they don't, you're a fanatic. If you spend time every week going soul winning and they don't, you're a fanatic. If you read your Bible during lunch at work and they don't, you're a fanatic. But be careful not to judge people by that same standard. If someone's doing something more than us because they love Jesus, we're going to say they're a fanatic. We, just, we, we choose to base spirituality on ourselves. If somebody chooses to dress more conservatively than me, am I going to look at them and say, oh, they're just a fanatic? Well, I'm tempted to. Every one of us is. Because they're doing something more than us. They go to church. I go to church on Sunday. I practically live here, right? Um, go to church on Sunday and, and Wednesday and go soul winning on Saturday. Go you know, follow up on Tuesday. But if somebody went to church on a Thursday, <sighs> they're doing more than me. They're probably fanatic. Somebody wears something more conservative than me. Or, or their, their decision to, uh, on what they're going to watch 
is maybe a, a higher standard than what I choose, I, I got to be careful. I don't look at those, oh, fanatic. What do we do? We, we judge people based on where we are. Jesus said, listen, I'm sending you a sheep in the midst of wolves, and, and you're going to be judged by these councils of men, these uh, groups of your peers. I'm going to move off of that. I got uncomfortable there for a minute. Ephesians 4.13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's use, let's use Christ as our, as our standard. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You're going to be judged by somebody in your neighborhood. Somebody that saw you get up this morning and load up your kids in your cars wearing a, a suit, if that's what you wore this morning or whatever you wore this morning, got your Bible under your arms. You're going to, your neighbors are going to look at you and say, Christians, fanatics, whatever it is they say. You'll be judged. They'll, they'll, they'll know. But in verse 17, he says they're going to scourge you in the synagogues. I'll move on this real quick, but established religions have rarely been friendly to Bible-believing Christians. Jesus said, I'm sending you as, wolves, as sheep in the midst of wolves. They're, they're going to scourge you in their places of worship. You, you'll be persecuted. We don't understand this in America today. We're starting to see a little bit of it. If, you don't bake, if you're a baker and you don't bake a, a cake for a homosexual wedding, then you're starting to see a little bit of that. It's financial. It's, it's going to happen more. It will happen more. Jesus said it will happen. It happened to the disciples. Every one of the apostles, except for the apostle John, died a martyr's death. That means they died because they would not change what they believed. Uh, we, we may see that in our day. Jesus said uh, they're going to scourge you in their synagogues. He said in verse 18, you'll be brought before governors and kings. Politicians and government leaders have a history of using religion to advance their own careers. And this is just, this is history. If they think that being known as a Christian will help them, then they'll try to be known as a Christian. This goes back 1,700 years at least. I mean, Constantine did it. He saw the, the blazing cross in the sky and the words, by this conquer, and he forced everybody to become Christians. Why? Well, the Christians were being persecuted. And the more they persecuted, the more they multiplied. And they were just amazingly strong and resilient. And he, he saw the success of the Christians, and he said, you need to be those I'm going to be one of those. I don't believe Constantine became a Christian. I think he tried to adapt Christianity to his pagan religion, and, and, but, but that, that is normal. That's what politicians do. Even Donald Trump, who seemed to want nothing to do with the Bible before he became a politician, uses it to advantage. Some people say he got saved. Uh, maybe he did. I hope he got saved. I mean, that'd be wonderful. But you can, I mean, just, just look. Politicians, that's just what they do. They often, I know there's some honest ones, and I think that's an awesome thing, but government, and he says, governors and kings. You're going to be taken before government, uh, governors and kings, and, and you will be a testimony against them. You're going to be a witness against them. As, Christian, as a Christian, God expects, you to, God expects you to stand for the truths of the Word of God, no matter who is in power. You're going to be taken... He says before governments, governors, before kings, and, and you're going to be a testimony. You're going to be persecuted. Eventually, God will judge them, and you'll be the evidence against them. Verse 18, he says you'll be a testimony against them. He says that families will turn on each other. We read that, that, that Christ's disciples will be hated of all men. You know, our world hates the name of Jesus. It's interesting. So many other names could be, could be brought up, and, and, and they're fine, but the name of Jesus, and okay, here's an example. A local pastor in, in Colorado Springs, um, he's being, uh, let's see, he's battling a Colorado city over his church's Jesus-related ads on public transit benches. The controversy in Colorado Springs involves ads on about 20 bus stop benches, this was from last year, that say, Jesus is Lord. They, they took out ads. They bought them. They put them on the bus stop benches. Pastor Lawson Purdue said he was told that the ads will no longer be allowed if they refer to Jesus. The city transit agency told him that if the name Jesus was allowed, hate messages would have to be allowed too. Our world just doesn't like the name of Jesus. City councils are being told, you can have somebody come and pray, but they may not mention the name of Jesus. There's all, you, could just, you could look at all the different lawsuits and things going on about that. One pastor... And I couldn't find the story, but I'll tell you as best as I can remember. One pastor was invited to, to pray before, a, I think it was a city council meeting. 
and he chose not to pray in the name of Jesus. He was asked about it later, and he, he told whoever it was that was interviewing him, he said something like this, our world just doesn't like the name of Jesus, so I feel it's better just to work around that. The name of Jesus. Our world doesn't like the name of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. He said, you're going to be judged among the councils, the people of your peers. Um, um, you're you're going to be brought into the synagogues. The, the religious leaders of the established religions, they're not going to like you. And even kings and governors, you'll be persecuted in front of them. Listen, we're like sheep sent among wolves. But here's how to keep from being scared. Here's how to keep from being discouraged. If you would go back, if you would. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. And we're done with this. Just remember who sent you. Sheep among wolves. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, 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 I am at a very big disadvantage if I'm a sheep and there's wolves. I've got to remember who sent me. As you go out and you try to stand for right, remember who sent you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says, Behold, I send you. Remember who sent you. Jesus sent you. Yeah, you're going you're to stand before all these people. You're going to be judged. You're going to have people not like you. You may even be persecuted. In this case, he said you're going to be. Just remember who sent you. Father, I pray that you would use this message to help us to live for you. As we go into this world this week, we are sheep among wolves. The world wants to attack us. The world wants to pull us down. The world wants to turn us away from you. Help us just remember who sent us. Lord, there's so much more we could say about this. I know this is a, an awesome, wonderful topic. But Lord, I pray that as we go this week, we'd simply remember who sent us. The creator of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords, sent us to preach the gospel to this world. Sent us to live as a light in the darkness. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us remember. 